I'm still getting used to these digital presentations and I miss everyone. But um, I'm Cherry and today I'm attempting to peer into the distance. I work on accessibility at Ubisoft and I used to be a freelance specialist. Projects I contributed to before UB include Horizon Zero Dawn and Forbidden West, Destiny 2, Avengers and Dreams. At Ubisoft it's been Watch Dogs Legion, AC Valhalla, Far Cry 6 and more in development. My job is still a bit of a mystery from what I hear. I'm sort of a hyper-specialized designer with accessibility expertise in everything from 3Cs to systems, level, world, interaction, audio. Since it's broad, of course, my expertise is secondary to senior designers in those fields. We shape gameplay and player interaction together with the concept of accessibility, guiding design intentions, facilitating tech, brainstorming constraints, and yeah, the tough decisions about prioritization because we always have them. There's a bit more to it. It's not easy to gab about without specifics, but most importantly, I'm working on finding ways to pass knowledge on so that all designers can become experts in what they need to know. Let's suppose I've been doing this work for more than a minute. I think we started to see a shift in pace around five years ago, but maybe even a bit before, 2014 maybe? It's kind of hard to put a pin in it. It was a slow burn, but suddenly we got the snowball over the summit and we've been chasing after it ever since. It's time to take a moment, stop running and reflect. I know it's hard, but it's okay, I promise. In 2018, Ian invited me for the final talk at the second inaugural EH, GAConf. A totally low stakes, low pressure talk, right? Well, I had just three weeks. I wasn't sure what I wanted to talk about. I just started writing and it turned out super personal. Before I knew it, I'd written a love letter. It was complicated, like any love. Games saved my life and they were hurting me. Centered around my first stroke when I realized it wasn't me, it was the games. The seed for game design though was planted way back as a wee five-year-old beb, falling in love with programming a Jessup's turtle on a BBC Micro. Then I stuck my hand in games accessibility in 2010. A programmer friend at United Front Games gifted me Mod Nation Racers. I was now a hardcore fan of this little play create cart racer. There were some really neat bugs that players exploited, which was fascinating. But more legitimately, maybe, the community created amazingly complex things with totally rudimentary design tools. So I was obsessed with how players were interacting with the systems they were given. Thanks to winning a spot on the PlayStation blog, I met lifelong friends in the lobby, but I'd wake up with my hands frozen in a claw. Probably because we raced and laughed until 3am most nights, but I had to mod my controller for the first time and fight off friendly jabs about how trigger extensions were cheating. It was personal and emotional, but I also wanted it to be designed forward. So people had concrete steps to take away with them that day. We were still trying to get through the door. There were a few exceptions and Household Games announced their work with Clinton Lexa that week the ball was already rolling. It just felt like we couldn't rock the boat. There was still a lot of talk about why it was important or if, if it was even possible. So I tried to be extra gentle, like, please let us in. We promise we won't change things. We promise we won't disrupt. I said I was proud then, and it's even more true now. We're here. Everyone's listening. People are asking the big stuff. How do we do this? and how we do we do it better. Something I called cherry mode back then seemed to really resonate. I think someone yelled it out and tweeted it. Brannon, maybe? Was that you? I still believe in the idea that disabled players can be um, empowered by customizing their experience. And I wasn't the only one talking about options because it was how we were opening doors. Then chats with mentors helped me see that this could be prescriptive. I needed to change it up. The results weren't what I anticipated, and for me personally, I wish I hadn't taken an approach that felt like a softer and more acceptable idea of what accessibility is. Everything contributes to the road we've traveled, so no regrets. Besides, we can make all the noise we like now we've arrived, right? A lot of my strengths as a designer are thanks to the opportunity to learn from so many of the industry's best over the last several years. Collaboration isn't a prescription, it's an exchange of expertise to develop robust ideas and intentions. So my approach is accessibility by intentional design. It's holistic, 
while actively destigmatizing and working towards accessibility from the beginning. Not because it's more affordable or easier, it is both of those things, but importantly, because it means opportunity. So hi, I'm in a bit of a different part of the map. Let's chat. <laughs> Common thinking on games accessibility is usually one idea with slightly different words. Accessibility options, settings, or features. We can get a lot of insight here. What we've been doing, how we've approached it, and how that informs how we talk about it. A complete circle. We're racing full throttle now and have achieved so much already. That's why this is the exact moment to slow us down, reassess, and consider the future impact of what we're doing today. I ended up over there on the map because games accessibility as a whole is a totally fun design problem to solve to me. Everything is a system. I'm always reworking my approaches and growing my knowledge from elsewhere. I also had so many philosophical conversations and I'm really thankful for those. You all know who you are. But remember, no matter how it feels, we're never alone on the map. We have some questions to answer. Are we going in the right direction? How would we even know without waypoints? And where do we look for clues? There's a great concept to pull from. We all know about calling people out. Well, I try to practice calling people in. It distributes the responsibility and removes judgment. We look at the reasons why things happen and we talk through it with kindness. And we hear empathy is important for design. Well, it's time to level up. Empathy is passive and it's heavily influenced by our perspective. Compassion demands active engagement in someone else's perspective and follow through. Exploring compassionate design got me thinking about the relationship to knowledge. And I came to, if we work with compassion, but without knowledge, we can end up with misguided results. But if we have knowledge and no compassion, we might end up lost, overconfident in our solution and wrong about impact. This could be seen as paternalism, action without consent. A misguided approach is usually good intentions. We don't usually have a ton of time to get philosophical and meander, but we need to make time because later is too late. We also need compassion for each other. Compassion plus knowledge brings comprehension. Obstacles to effective compassion and bi are bias and privilege. I love this talk by Tatiana Mack called Systems of Systems. Give it a Google or follow the link. She illustrates concisely how history and culture shape everything we design. We're born into most privileges. We might not seek bias out, but it is our responsibility to identify and undo them. We need accurate and destigmatized perceptions for design. We might think that we're acting with compassion when we're not. Intent does not erase impact. Tatiana highlights the words intent and impact. Passive rarely guarantees impact. We got, really got to do the work to defog our perspectives since they're colored for us. Here, looks like I'm the quest giver. Beyond the social model of disability, we fight the instinct to protect and provide. It might feel noble, like a good deed. That's a clue it'll end up patronizing. If our good feeling is central to the actions, it's intent over impact. Disabled people tolerate the outcome of this a lot in the day to day. We destroy pity, unrecognized but buried, so dig deep. For me, the feeling is a quiet, sad butterfly in the pit of my stomach. It's all around us, endless disability stuff framed by pity. Notice how every single video has a melancholy but triumphant piano track? Subtleties clouding how we think about each other. And pity distorts, distract, uh, pity distorts compassion because we're looking down. Vanquish our guilt, that sounds so dramatic. But it is painful knowing we didn't do enough. But don't project it on what we do next. Guilt ruins the trust we have in ourselves to do what we do best. Design, research, communicate, facilitate. We're more likely to take prescriptive solutions without checking just to get something done. With all this in mind, we'll claim a broader vision by working with ourselves and being open to others as part of our creative processes. Re revisit frequently. Without defining for ourselves, we follow. We'll guess everyone else must be right if something's popular enough. Bias is cognitive too. 
teaching games accessibility intensively for years, and a thought just hit me last week. We don't need to redefine accessibility. We actually need to define it for ourselves. I'm disabled and come from other accessibility. I've been harping on about how accessibility is different in games, but I didn't twig. So maybe the current thinking is undefined. It's relatively straightforward to see how, going from, oh, I didn't mean for that to be a barrier in the design, to let's create an option to avoid it. Seems logical to understand that as accessibility. Oh, but this is a narrative fallacy. It's a cognitive conclusion from backwards reasoning without having all the info. It's normal to simplify so we can process reality. And on top of that, in games, we have a culture of simplified to produce. It's a solid practice to reverse engineer our work and look back on postmortems. We also need to be aware of the potential for hindsight bias, especially in an emerging field. It feels logical when there is truth to it. An option might facilitate accessibility. Other times, it's a bandage over the problem. But it's not accessibility itself. Some aspects of accessibility will always need to be addressed by options. Player customization can be empowering, but that's not always true. It's more complicated than we thought, but it's OK. Turning to other features, I can picture a feature standing on a hill with a big boomy voice. I'm the king of the world. I am accessibility. But like, that's just a lot to put on a feature. They can contribute, but they can't fully represent accessibility, even for one person. We might talk about it also as a tangible object. Say, this game has accessibility, but this game doesn't. Accessibility is always there, just in varying degrees. The effort or intent of the creators doesn't even matter, because it didn't spring into existence when developers became aware of it. Every game has always been more or less accessible. I think we give it a solid shape so it can be pointed at and talked about, but this is really the efforts made for accessibility. Again, part of the picture, no doubt. But all of this says a lot about intent and nothing about impact. This tweet from Bryce tickled me because we should embrace cognitive dissonance. It's where we find reality. He says, voiceover is a feature of iOS. Closed captions are feature a feature of movies. Accessibility is not blank, except when it is. We are not in the business of absolutes. For context, Billy Gregory, Gregory regularly says that accessibility isn't a feature and a lack of accessibility is a bug. I yelled yes to both of them out loud, but then a few days later, I was thinking features are still the center of this picture. Yes, voiceover is a feature, it provides and improves accessibility. It was even created for accessibility. It still isn't accessibility. It's a feature. I felt like we were getting closer there. But Converse logic, so, so Converse logic tells us that all games features impact accessibility because if a player can interact with it, it needs accessibility consideration. And official community research hasn't disproved this yet. But features exist in a web, inside systems, inside our various realities. All right, this is where I ended up. Accessibility is a player's access to the gaming experience that's either improved or impeded by the design decisions that we make. It's relative to an individual player. Some features might be more critical to increasing accessibility for some players. No single thing or group of things can embody a global impact. Some more context is needed for the difference between an accommodation and accessibility. We can tell by looking at impact which one it is. An accommodation is a concession or assistance we provide when there isn't equitable access. It's usually when existing systems are least malleable. Accessibility is access. And the unsaid is that it's equitable and inclusive. So imagine a level main entrance to a building. A ramp would be accessibility too, unless entrances at the side or the back, which are accommodations. Worse, a bell for a worker to bring you a ramp. Now you're a task in someone's day. An assist would be if you needed someone to push you up a ramp that's too steep. Worst, someone carries you in. Yep, 
that happens. Accessibility is participation on par with everyone else. No inconvenience, embarrassment, or pity. And it doesn't make someone a spectacle. There are times when an accommodation is all we can do. Is something better than nothing? Not always. The world has a lot of harmful accommodation in the disguise of accessibility. It's not our responsibility as games developers, but context to define our goals. The first time we use an accommodation, it feels amazing. A popular fancy restaurant just grateful you can get into. After time, less so. When this happened to me, I wondered if typical customers would be okay with the smelly garbage entrance, dirty hands, inconvenience kitchen staff, and sitting at the only table without a light. The accessible seats in theatres are up front, far to the side. Your friends can't sit with you, but not that they'd want to. The second screen for captions goes in your lap. Good luck watching the movie. At least you can go, right? We have special seating areas not because they're better for us. It was business and never went further. That's segregation. Eventually, people disengage. The consequences can be unintentional thanks to a lack of insight. As we head for maturity in our field, now is the time to reflect and grow our compassion. We need to concretely define our experiences because what's equitable is, a, is complex for games. So we can provide experiences to disabled players on par with everyone else. Options open a door and it felt amazing right now. What about down the road? Are we being equitable and are players being siloed? When we do have to make accommodations, if we ask these questions, we can ensure it's the best we can do to break ground and destigmatize and avoid segregation at all costs. In the end, sometimes the best we can do is just that. Even if the perfectionist fights back, Perfectionism lends itself to the work. It's also a risk to us and our teams. We care so much about players, colleagues, and the work. We want to do things right. We can only keep moving if we accept concessions. Sometimes it's not so big, just a lower level of completion. Like, don't have a full UX experience for a menu narration yet, as we don't. We inch along. It's a recipe for burnout, believe me. Um, but Tara gave a great talk at GAConf last year and I'm going to be watching it this week myself. Just take care of yourself, okay? Because it's not all or nothing. Sometimes it's three steps forward, one step back, and half a step sideways. That's a net win though, right? I know we're aching to be told how to solve accessibility, but we're jumping a little bit ahead there. Accessibility isn't something that gets done. Bam, we achieved it. It has to become part of every single thing we do, and it never goes away. Think of it like a magic eye trick. Slow down, relax our muscles, then flex them in a new way, and shifting focus to the spaces around our, so our approaches so far, we never know what shape we'll build. The comprehension we need to succeed is just going to take time to learn. It's painful to acknowledge this because we impact human beings. We can't change the fabric of reality. It's going to be a balancing act between employing solutions and building comprehension. Here's one of infinite ways that tech and UX frame accessibility. User research is an essential component to expanding compassion and knowledge, evolving comprehension, taking the same rigorous and scientific approaches to typical user research. Our principles inform design. These are high level things we believe in. They're defined by the compassion and knowledge we learn. Guidelines are specific background knowledge documented. We have some of these in games already. Standards are rigorous and help maintain focus and more precisely defined solutions. In tech, they're often defined by a combination of laws, government, practice, and committees. In games, we have a habit of unofficial standards. Usually it's something popular in a game or it's something that's been done more than once. For accessibility, this could be our Achilles heel. All of these should be approached while undoing bias and realigning perspective. They aren't always, which is how we still get exclusion and harm in the tech industry as well. We could take some ideas here, but not necessarily all of them work for us. We are different. There's no standard game experience, so can we standardize? Or does it make sense to? Would this stop us before we got started? Maybe we could just standardize the fundamentals, you know, things like tech size. 
The fundamentals are a really small part of games accessibility. We have complex systems that are crafted to elicit feelings like challenge or triumph. Vast modes of interactivity with multiple inputs, cameras, interaction, everything. Then there's genres. Standardizing games accessibility is a minefield. And we need to be honest, we're still figuring it out. If we don't admit that, things will get locked in too soon. Principles are what we should be defining right now before we forge on. We need specialists for that. And we're extremely limited, unbelievably so for the size of our industry. Let alone the bandwidth to train people, it's a knowledge bottleneck. I'm super passionate about solving this, and I hope in a year or less, I'll have something more concrete to report back on how we've been approaching our knowledge sharing. But for now, it's gonna take a moment. Hang on, wait, what about QA and tracking or measuring accessibility? Well, we're mostly using checklist approaches across the industry. It's great to cover things we know we want to hit, such as certain levels of controls, color, or text accessibility. It works well with features and takes more training, knowledge, and a flexible approach for beyond that. But we should invest in that training. Working to check and track the level of accessibility beyond what the options there are, and if the options aren't even needed, someone gets a high score, surely. We can't pass fail games accessibility, and that's really unique. May we never fall into the pit of web content accessibility guidelines, aka WCAG. I heard you like guidelines for your guidelines. There's guides for guidelines, documentation, techniques, and then more documentations and diagrams, and then documentations for how to navigate between the documentation. The web industry needs an exhaustive network of specialists, consulting firms, and people writing internal documentation and training just to use their guidelines. Thankfully, so far, our guidelines are lightweight. Although I have found they don't necessarily work for developers, especially on bigger teams with more specialization between roles. It's organized from player perspective and disability types, which means more specific designers don't know where to look for what they need to know. And in design, everything overlaps. There's no such thing as features for blind accessibility or deaf accessibility, etc. We could center those players in brainstorming solutions then we expand our view. This way we can avoid neglecting overlaps, conflicting barriers, and in the end, make more universal and likely less stigmatizing designs, especially being cautious of validation, validating with only one or two players. Our guidelines are strongest as knowledge libraries for specialists, producers, user researchers, and others with global transitional roles that need to learn from the biggest picture. I don't want to rework what we have because they're pretty good for their use. Maybe a key for various disciplines to dip into, but I'm working closer to detailed design documentation. Design thinking can help us gently melt accessibility into existing processes. In games, we already have death by a thousand processes. Accessibility is a mindset shift that we apply to everything we do. The Nielsen Norman group is a good starting point to learn about design thinking. There's more models from IBM and others adapting it to their needs. I wanted to adapt it for us. It's still a work in progress, but at Ubisoft, our teams have overlapping processes and central centralized production gates. Even so, there can be big differences on team structure and the day to day. This design thinking should fold in anywhere because it's dynamic and flexible. We move through the nodes, discovering, defining, designing, developing, constantly revisiting whenever we need. Just because you get to that develop stage doesn't mean you don't iterate. And when you do, make sure you go back to the relevant nodes. It turns with you at your pace like a wheel. Cross through the center regularly between listen and analyze for user research and to loop in specialist and design feedback, even as early as concept phases. Documentation anchors our mindsets. Highlighting accessibility considerations in your design docs ensures consistency and avoids overwriting critical decisions as you iterate. It's not just for designers. Design thinking helps us see how accessibility is everyone's responsibility and where we fit. It should also help with knowing when and how to grow your comprehension or when to reach for a specialist. Finally, the fun part. I'm very sad there's so little time for this, but maybe next year at GA, uh, next year's GA Conf I can finally do a fun talk, please. 
I hope so. Anyway, um, I don't know a single designer who can turn off their design brain. So quick, here's some shower thoughts. Ooh, navigation systems in Ghost of Tsushima. Players are frustrated when waypoints go away precisely for the reasons we want to throw them out. They're extremely visible, high contrast, and have long established purpose. Players head straight for them with little exploration. Whenever we move on from a widely used system, we take on a responsibility to teach players how to work without them and show them why. Waypoints actually come with pounds of accessibility problems anyway, so I'm excited for this opportunity as the industry try keeps trying to head this way. Ghost of Tsushima would have smashed it if they'd just taken it a little bit further. By comprehending a broader range of interaction experiences, such as low vision or cognitive experiences. The two levels of navigation systems is what got my system's brain excited. Can I say the word systems anymore? Oh my gosh, who wrote this? Um, the primary navigations are onboarded, maybe not definitively or repetitively enough. Follow the wind, the bird, the fox, etc. Taking the visibility and audio a little bit further, adding haptics and visual information for audio cues, the level of accessibility would have been profound by design. And oh my gosh, that's the exciting part. The cinema and the satisfaction. I'm actually sad that more couldn't experience that. These enhancements could have been optional, maybe the extreme ends, but imagine how much the universal player experience could have been improved too. Now the secondary systems were broader layer of establishing a new language, mostly for the player to figure out themselves. A lot of people didn't. Even going back to the wind, it wasn't just the animated cartoony visualization, the entire world moved and pointed. Not to mention the fox, the seasons, the tri gates, the sounds of bells and crickets. We can't underestimate the part of accessibility that's leading and teaching. I love Horizon Zero Dawn. Do I do? Everyone knows it. But the combat is literally systems of systems of systems of systems. And it's wonderful because it creates mind blowing player agency. That's chewy because I couldn't think of another adjective, but that's how it feels to me. One day I'm watching streamers play many different kinds and they all default to whacking the enemies with a stick. It's actually a spear. It's massively underpowered. And I'm guessing it's that way to discourage this kind of play. Ineffective and frustrating. They all ranted about hating the game. This could speak volumes for increasing understanding of our systems. With rigorous user research, we don't, without you, rigorous user research even, rigorous, vigorous, vigorous user research, my goodness, without rigorous user research, we don't know for sure. But it's a fun design exercise. Interestingly, there are multiple teaching methods and codexes. So maybe it's a lack of reinforcement or intensity of the moment. We need to broaden our understanding of cognitive and motor capabilities. The focus system is a beautiful example of a narrative gameplay feature that increases accessibility. The game depends on precision, as well as rapid flexibility in weapon tool and tactics in high intensity and in high intensity encounters. The enemies become hard to impossible to beat without tactically targeting specific pieces of the armor with an elemental to boot. I really like writing myself tongue twisters today. Some are shielded even on top of that. These parts are hard to identify, engage, and when you engage focus, they're not only clearly highlighted, but you'll be able to see the weaknesses for the entire enemy. Disengage and the highlighting stays around for a fair amount of time to help with precision. Imagine the possibilities of leveraging systems like this for accessibility, especially if we focused on fundamentals like interface sizing, contrast, and player's reaction and motor capabilities. Hey, I'm not going to talk about The Last of Us Part 2's options. Although they were a huge achievement and opened so many doors, the listening feature is narratively bestowed on the player characters from the very first game. It resonated with me because it echoes some of the ways I leverage my sensory sensitivity thanks to my autism. It was also a crucial gameplay feature to enhance players' abilities to observe, plan, and execute complex tactics. This feature is a huge win for accessibility due to increasing visibility, allowing time and space to plan, identifying specific enemies and their patterns in high intensity encounters with low lighting, enhancing audio, prov 
providing visual and it provided visual cues for audio cues. It goes on. Imagine what we can do if we realize the accessibility impacts. It is also how Naughty Dog took their high contrast contrast mode from Uncharted 4. The fight pit, here we go. When it comes down to it, ultra hard games are a damn exciting design problem. There's a reason that so many systems designers who are huge fans of roguelikes or lights, souls likes, metroidvania, multiplayers, precision platforms, or even horror. The finesse, the balance, the challenge of challenging players. Mainstream games are now even influenced by these genres too. They're not incompatible with accessibility. Why? Because we make the rules. What the hell is challenge? What exactly do we want players to feel and experience? Lay everything out in the context of human interaction. Navigation is full of barriers in these genres. How do we increase accessibility but maintain the challenge even in non-combat systems? Interestingly, Deathloop Death has written narrative clues. It was flagged as an access barrier because of the text styling. I have another take. What if the stylization was to maintain and replicate the delicate challenges of path and clue finding while also increasing access to understanding, visibility, and discovery? Only the designers know for sure, but it's a great shower thought on how we could be designing gameplay accessibility solutions to mirror the challenges that we have in our games. In the Surge 2, <clears throat> the best Souls-like series, players can leave graffiti to help each other find their paths, hidden loot, rare stuff, or even hidden enemies or other danger. With player rating and a limit for how many you'll see, the griefing is actually non-existent. This reduces barriers in visibility, memorization, pathfinding, and cognitive loads. Even Bloodborne has two lovely community assist features, and this created a much healthier community around that game. Hades, do I need to explain? I just found this brilliant meme on Google and it says it all. Friendship ended with dying. Now God mode is my best friend. Thanatus's face is scratched out with a giant red X. Let's clarify the takeaway on options real quick. We'll always need options because there's no universal experience. They can be powerful if we have a full picture. They are just options, not accessibility options. All options are for everyone, and all options increase accessibility. When we silo, we reinforce stigma from elsewhere. We have research at Ubisoft that illustrates accessibility menus are confusing and much less usable in addition to the stigma. It doesn't have to go in an options menu even. Ensuring that customization is empowering and not stigmatizing is all in our approach. Imagine how we could take player customization and take it further and bring these features into game flow narratively. Unprecedented levels of immersion and the best feeling. Players feel like you made it just for them. This is the future I work for. Maybe we even need to evolve our options menus. They're kind of clunky now. Imagine modern usability features, player sorting, uh, players sorting, customizing, and bookmarking what they need. This is it. This is the slide. Uh, be intentional in everything and work to get the full picture. <laughs> I'm not cool enough to do a Faith No More uh, impression right now. <laughs> Everyone belongs in this party. Our roles are powerful AF. For designers, define design redefine. Our implementers, tech, show the designers the possibilities and your ideas are invaluable too. Together you stretch the limits. Facilitators, our producers, leads, QA, and more. Make space for your teams and allow them to do what they do best. Don't be prescriptive and use checklists as hints for the roadmap, not the map itself. You keep us grounded. Researchers, apply our perspective shifts and principles. Usually, we avoid player suggestions by favoring observation and rigorous approach. Treat accessibility the same. Learn to identify barriers yourself and how to engage players so they can talk barriers and not feature requests. You bring us compassion. Consultants and advocates, nothing about us without us, invaluable. Avoid prescription and assumption on developers' intentions, priorities, and approach. Bring ideas into brainstorming by allowing designers to flex their expertise and take us to places we didn't even know we wanted or needed. The messengers, 
our media and content creators, how we discuss closes the circle. Today's prescriptive shift and the groundwork is for your work too. Everyone shapes the future. Never underestimate your impact and educational abilities. A bosky. Yes, games as a whole are for everyone. Not every game suits everyone. I want to work to get to a place where disabled players can make the same choices as any other player. Are they excluded because of an access barrier or do they simply get a chance to say, I don't like this game. We all, players, reviewers, experts, developers, need to find the lines between what's an access barrier and what's truly part of the experience. This is ultimately what makes games accessibility more challenging than any other industry. Explicit communication to players helps define expectation. Hades says, you are going to die over and over. Get used to it. It's what you can do. No matter where or who you are, questions are OP. The key to collaboration and moving everything toward a future we all want. This is how we, we solve for accessibility. And in the end, as Bryce said, we're not in the business of absolutes. This was a challenging talk and a challenging time. Never take the easy road, friends. In a recent meeting, a designer came forward about how terrible they felt for not considering other disabilities because they have dyslexia. And Clinton, half-coordinated Lexa, just popped up and said something so profound I had to write it down. It's not what we didn't know yesterday, but what we do tomorrow with what we know now. Thank you for having me as always and see you soon.